Hey folks, it's your main man Sabado. Welcome or welcome back to the channel. Uh, this is a channel where I talk about all things early retirement. I had the opportunity to retire at 51 and I recognize that that's not necessarily realistic for everybody, but I think it is realistic for everybody to live their best life. And so what I really would like all of us to think about isn't necessarily getting to the finish line and retiring early, but thinking about the ways that we can live our best life. And I do that through sharing my experience with you. And there are some things that went well. There are some things that didn't go well. But ultimately, my goal is just to keep it real with you. Hope some of this stuff resonates with you and, and inspires you to live the life that you want to lead and hopefully get away from the rat race. Because I think we can all agree that if we could spend our time doing anything, most of the time, it wouldn't be working. Uh, over the last period of time, I've gotten a bunch of comments. And, and what we're going to talk today about are some of the comments that I got, at least one of the comments that I thought was really important and I think can benefit from your input as well as my input. I'm going to do the best that I can to try to answer the question, but I'm not a financial advisor. Never have been, never played one on TV, but I do have some life experience and I do have a little bit of knowledge and, and understanding of certain things. And so I can't necessarily share the step-by-step -step path to get from A to Z for all situations. But what I can do is give you my perspective on it and really hope that that perspective helps you start to ask some of the right questions. So on that note, let's go ahead and get into it. I had a comment last week from a, a subscriber named G Bernie 4714. And I have my notes here. So if you see me looking down, that's why I apologize in advance. But the question was, what is the best way to approach retirement when you're in your 60s? My wife and I are debt free, no mortgage, no HELOC, which is a home equity line of credit, or credit card debt. $175,000 only for retirement, and we have $27,000 a year for our 401k, which means I think they contribute $27,000 a year for their 401k. Thinking that getting to a million dollars at our age will be tough. And so the first thing I want to talk about, and again, this is, I, I would not say this constitutes advice, but this is just perspective. And I first, we would say you're going to want to make sure that you have a conversation with your financial advisor. The next thing I'm going to say is I know there's a lot of conversation around the idea that you have to have a million dollars in order to retire. But I think that million dollar number really comes down to your specific circumstances. And I don't think there's a specific number that you have to have. It's been my belief and based on the experiences that I've had with my financial advisor that it really comes down to lifestyle and expenses. And so the first step is really to take a look at what are your monthly expenses and based on your monthly expenses, how would you what percentage of your retirement funds would you be drawing down on a monthly or, or, or annual basis? And if you calculate that in for inflation, if you took $5,000 a month out now, what would that mean 10 years from now? And what percentage? Because, and as we'll talk about a little bit later, there's what's called the 4% rule that a lot of people talk about. But I, I think that out of the gate, you're already in a really good financial position because you're debt free, which is which is critical. As my friends would say, that's clutch. You have a, a strong focus on your retirement. It's something that you want to do. It's something you've set your mind to and you're at a point where uh, you're going to be able to get Social Security in a few years. There, there are things that are working in your favor. And there's a few strategies that I think will help you make the most out of your retirement years, or at least help you down the path of making that decision without the added stress of feeling like you have to get to a million dollars when you may never get there based on your unique set of circumstances. So I'm going to go through a few strategies that if you employ them will at least get you in the going down the right path, at least in my opinion. And you could use these as a springboard for your conversations with a financial professional. So fair enough. Oh, and before I get started, I also ask that if there's any of you that are watching and have another idea or find yourself in a situation, you can either ask the follow up questions or you could talk about what's worked well for you. What what did you do when you were in that situation? Because the fortunate but unfortunate piece, fortunate from a personal perspective, 
that I was able to retire at 51, but unfortunate because I'm not 60 in the, sp the specific set of circumstances. And so again, it goes back to the unique set of circumstances. So the first thing I think you should really focus on if you want to get to retirement sooner rather than later is maximize those 401k contributions. And because you're over the age of 50, you could make catch-up contributions that'll bring you to, I believe it's $30,000 a person. So in that period of time between now and the time that you do retire, you're able to put money away on a tax-deferred basis at the clip of $60,000 a year. $30,000 for you, $30,000 for your significant other. And if you continue to put in $60,000 a year, you look at the market conditions, you look at the compound interest, you look at all of those factors, what you're going to find is whatever it is you have now, I think you said $175,000, that $175,000 is going to continue to compound over time. The, the second thing I would mention is you might want to consider some additional retirement investments besides your 401k. We get into a lot of conversations, and I think it's because at work, there's a lot of focus on the 401k, but you also have the Roth IRA. And the beauty of the Roth IRA, and I talk about it in a different video, but the beauty of the Roth IRA is the Roth IRA takes money that you've already been taxed on, puts it into an investment account so you can continue to get that compound interest. But then when you take that money out, when it's time to withdraw it, whatever capital gains that you've gotten or that you've accumulated with that through compound interest, you don't pay taxes on. So with a 401k, for example, a 401k, you put the money in tax deferred so you don't get taxed on it up front. But when you take the distributions, you get taxed on it down the road. With the Roth IRA, it's the exact opposite. So you, you're, it's, it's post-tax dollars. So it's money that's already been taxed when you got paid, whether it's through an employer or whatever the means are that you get your finances, assuming it's legal. Then when, as it continues to grow, if let's say you take $100,000 and it grows to a million dollars, well, that $900,000 isn't taxed because it's already from tax, uh, taxable dollars. So you could look at some of those. You could look at IRAs. There, there are different. And, and again, each of these have certain income requirements and dollar requirements. So there's some, there are things that you're going to want to take a look further into. And again, a financial advisor will, will walk you through all of that. And even if you don't go with the full services of a financial advisor, you can you could certainly get a consultation where they start pointing you in the right direction and let, at least let you know where some of the some of the 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 um the minefields might be as it relates to as it relates to your to your early retirement. But and then the the other thing and I, I think this is a a very, very under thought of uh, mechanism is dividend paying stocks. One of the things that my wife and it I did during COVID is when COVID hit, the markets tanked. And so I went to my financial advisor and I said, you know, I've always heard that you buy low and sell high. Since the markets tanked, what's your best strategy? So what my financial advisor did is he gave me a list of about 40 dividend paying stocks that were 40% or below in their market value. And here's what he said. He said, the beauty of it is, is even if you still are in volatile times, you're going to continue to get those dividends because each of these companies have paid dividends on a minimum of 12 years consistently for at least 12 years. And so if you're making 5%, and again, I know there's going to be some folks in the comments that say, you know, this isn't exactly right. But the gist of it is, is let's say a stock loses 3% in a year, but you're getting a 5% dividend then you're actually getting, you're making a net 2% on a stock that at some point is going to get to its market value. And you think about things like inflation and you think about all the economic factors that are being discussed today. But inflation, one of the ways that you hedge against inflation is because, it's th I'm sorry, is through the stock market. Because when you think about what inflation is, inflation is essentially the cost, the, the rising cost of goods and services. Well, you're paying that inflated price to somebody and it's the companies. And very rarely do companies over time devalue. Houses don't devalue. Things that you invest in do not devalue over time. And so as opposed to putting it in a, a, a savings account where you might get 3%, 4%, 5%, 
This year, the S&P 500 is up double digit. The Dow is up double digit. The NASDAQ is up double digits. And so you, you, so anywhere that you could put money into, into dividend paying stocks, where not only are you getting the returns, but you're also getting the money from your, uh, from your dividends, then it's, it's money on top of money and you reinvest that and it comes back up. And so I've multiplied, I don't want to say exponentially because I don't know that that might be overstating what I've been able to do, but I've gotten more in returns over time than I would have otherwise. And the last one I'll mention, I don't do CDs. I don't do treasuries. I, I just don't understand them well enough. And at some point I will. But the one thing I do do is I go into tax-free municipals and, and those are government bonds. And so when the, when you look at the government spending a bunch of money on X, a bunch of money on Y, well, they're taking a lot of that money from the bonds and those bonds grow tax-free. But the beauty of it is, is, is on the flip side of that, if those bonds uh, suffer like they had for the last few years, the losses on those bonds, you can harvest and use those to write off on your taxes if you do indeed itemize. So there's a bunch of stuff wrapped up in that, but I would just consider taking a look at investing in, in more mechanisms than just your 401k because the 401k, although it's a great tool, is it has limitations and you don't want to get caught into those limitations, particularly when, at least in your case, time is of the essence. Um, another area that might help you is depending on how your circumstances lay out. And again, this you got to be very careful when you go down this path to make sure it's right for you, but delaying your social security. I think you mentioned you were 60 years old, early sixties, maybe in your sixties. I'd have to go back in my notes and look, but if you take every year that you don't take 60, uh, retire, uh, social security from 62, cause I think you're eligible for social security at the age of 62. So every year, that you don't take social security, the amount that you're eligible for increases by 8%. And so that at a minimum is an 8% uh, return on the money that you would have otherwise gotten. So by delaying your social security as long as you can, you're going to, you're going to maximize your cash flow from social security because it's going to be 8% more the next year, 8% more the next year, 8% more the next year. And that comes into, into play when you get to a point where let's say one something happens to one spouse or the other and you're looking at where you're going to what you're going to get going forward so if one of the spouses passes away then you'll get the highest of the two but if both of you took it low then let's say one of you let's say both of you took it at uh 62 and it was $1500 a month so both of you are getting $1500 a month and it's $3000 a month well guess what now you only get 15 because you'll get the highest of the two. But let's say one of you takes it at 62 at $1,500 a month, and one of you takes it at 70, and let's say it's $2,500 a month. So when you take it, you're going to get $4,000 a month. Pretty funny how I did that math, isn't it? I, I didn't know I had that in me, but you're going to get that $4,000 a month, but then you'll drop back to the $2,500 as opposed to the $1,500. So it's, those are the types of considerations that you have to take into account. And so one of the strategies, as an example, that my wife and I have is one of us, I think my wife is going to take uh, Social Security when she's 62. We get that money. We're going to put it in. We're going to be able to use that for our monthly cash flow. And I'm going to wait until I'm 70. And so that way it helps hedge against if something were to happen because there's a point where your life expectancy really comes into play and you just never know how long some of these things are going to last. So that's uh that's that's another one to think about so just delaying your your social security one of the and and, and this next one is going to sound uh easy but it's one that i think in a lot of ways is controversial uh and i say that because i i, I do watch a lot of the other videos on youtube and i see people criticize this approach but this is an approach that's worked for me so I think it's an approach that might work for you. And I can only keep it real and give you my own experience. And so that's what I'm, that's what I'm going to do. And that's cutting costs and planning a modest lifestyle. Uh, there was a time when I would have nice cars. I'd have expensive stuff. And, you know, you start to realize that a lot of that stuff comes and goes. And it's really not that important. So I could go out and buy an $80,000 car. You know, they say don't buy an $80,000 car till you buy a house. But I could go out and buy an $80,000 car. 
And that's great. And that car is going to depreciate over time. And then by the time I'm ready to get a new car, I'm not really going to have any value in that car. And that money that I was using, I would have lost out on this 20% uh, market um, return. And so the question I had to ask myself is, do I want to go out and get an $80,000 car or do I want to put the money in the market? So then when I'm 51, I'm able to enjoy a lifestyle where I'm able to do what it is, what I want to do, when I want to do it, or nothing at all. And so it doesn't mean that we sacrifice. It doesn't mean that we suffer. It doesn't mean that we're not happy with what we have. We just don't have to get the most expensive of anything. And do we spend money on things that we think are nice? 100%. Do we go on nice vacations? 100%. But do we go out and buy a bunch of lavish things? No, because for us, life is about the experiences, not the things. And I think there's a statement that Susie Orman always says, people, then money, then things. And I, I believe in that 100% because people, there's a lot of people that I know that have really expensive stuff, really flashy stuff. And I say, well, how is it that they have all that flashy stuff? I know I made more money than them, but... They've got flashier stuff than I do. And then I have to bring it back down and say, well, Sabado, the reality is, is because I was able to put money away, because I deferred that gratification, which again is becoming a lost art for a lot of us. And please let me know if you agree with that. But the, the deferring that gratification put us in a position to where I was able to retire at the age of 51. So I, again, I like to keep it real, keep it pragmatic. And so, yeah, you can have the all the expensive stuff, but by buying all that expensive stuff, it may take away from your ability to live the type of life that you want to lead. And if you're on this channel, it's about living your best life and trying to find financial freedom and hopefully retiring before you get to the age of 70 years old. So, um, and, you know, there, and, and the next one is, you know, working part time or, or, you know, when you when you I, I don't like to talk about delaying retirement because there's always going to be a reason for another year, another year, another year. And and somebody that does a really nice job of laying that out is a, a, a friend of mine, a, a YouTube friend of mine, a guy named Joe Kuhn, K-U-H-N. Uh, and he has a channel, Joe Kuhn Loves Retirement. And one of the things he talks about is when he was working, there was always the pressure to go one more year, one more year, one more year. And the problem is, is you get to the point where you one more year yourself out. And he talks about in one of his most recent videos that when you start looking at your health span, you know, at 60 years old, you might have 50 year, 15 years until you start having medical issues that limit your ability to do stuff. And so if you're 60 and you wait till you're 61, 62, 63, well, what's the use of working for 40 years to have 10 good ones and then not be able to do anything? So I'm not a big fan of that, but I do think that what, you know, most of us work in, in jobs that if we asked ourselves, if we sat back and we asked ourselves, if I were independently wealthy or if I had enough money to do something different, would I do something different? I can tell you for myself, when I was working, I had a, I, I was doing, I, I was doing something that, that pushed my personal mission statement forward, but it was filled with aggregate, uh, aggravation. I was frustrated all the time. I was stressed out all the time, but I couldn't change vocations after I got to a certain point because I wouldn't have made the money to be able to sustain my lifestyle and save for retirement. And I think a lot of us find ourselves stuck in jobs that we don't necessarily hate them, but they're not what we would want to do if we won the lottery or if we had a choice to do something different. And so, but when you, when you retire, and you have enough to manage your daily expenses, then you find yourself in a situation where you can maybe go take that job doing something that you love to do that doesn't pay a lot. I, th I think I talk a little bit about how I took a four way, foray into substitute teaching. I've thought about going in, and working at a nursery just part time, not because I need the money necessarily. I mean, it, if I found a few hundred dollars on the ground, I would certainly pick it up. So again, I, I want to be honest about that. But at the end of the day, we are set up in such a way that our, our basic expenses are covered and any money on top of that really funds uh, just other stuff that we might want to do or it just it fills our cup because we're able to to do things. So one of the things I've talked about a lot of the stuff that I want to do, but one of the things I've been thinking about is becoming part of a grand jury. You know, I, I don't I'm not I'm not incredibly political, although I do have very strong beliefs politically, but 
I think that if you want to make changes to the system, you have to get involved in the system. And so I could criticize what's going on with policing in our country and what's happening in our municipalities, but what better way to get in the middle of that by joining the grand jury where you're seeing stuff firsthand and you're actually making part of the decision making for how things go forward and what happens and what goes next. Not as a way to get back, but as a way to give back to the community that we serve and become part of the process. And I think in my town, if you're part of the grand jury, they give you a stipend at the end of the year. Um, you know, a lot of these people that have these YouTube channels, I'm not one of them, but there's a lot of people you see, they, they sell you merch or they, they get a bunch of subscribers and then they get monetized and get paid for ads. And they're just doing something that they love to do. And they don't start saying, I want to get rich doing YouTube. I think a lot of the younger generations do because it's a way to make money. But when you see people my age and older doing YouTube channels, they're doing it because we have an institutional knowledge that we just want to share. And if you make a couple dollars with it, fine. But I don't have 200 and something videos up because I'm trying to get rich. Because if that were the case, then I'd be incredibly frustrated. You wouldn't be seeing me here today. I'm here because I'm able to help you. And guess what? I feel good about that. And so it gives you the opportunity to do that because I may not have had that opportunity uh, when I was working. Um, and then a couple of other things that you might be able to take a look at is, um, you know, just utilizing your, your health care spending account. Because one of the things that creeps up on us over time are health care costs. And early on, I, one, of the, one of the beauties of the Affordable Care Act is that in most municipalities, and again, if you have a differing opinion, please let me know in the comments because the comments are going to help round out some of what we're discussing today. But the Affordable Care Act really made health care affordable for people that have to go out and buy their own health care. And so the political pieces of it, people have differing opinions, but it's a lot less expensive for a 52-year-old man to go out and get health insurance and spend $600 a month than have to go out and get that same care and have to pay $2,000 a month. And that's because of the Affordable Care Act. And so you have that opportunity, but you also have what are called health care savings accounts. And so those are uh, accounts where you could put money away uh, pre-tax and then use that money as a way to um, fund health care costs down the road. Um, and, you know, I haven't had the situation where I had to use it, but I think, you know, when you look at the major costs in retirement, uh, taxes, inflation, and healthcare. Those are the three major risks. And so if you can mitigate one of those risks, then that gr creates a peace of mind. And ultimately, because we never know how things are going to turn out, we never know how we're, long we're going to live, everything we do, folks, and is, is just really a matter of peace of mind. And so it, it builds some of that peace of mind. So then you're not thinking, well, what happens if this happens or that happens or this happens? You have some money put away for that. And then the last one, and I, I mentioned we'd come back to this, so I'm, I'm coming back. I'm always keep my word. Is prioritizing safe withdrawal strategies. Again, I always say it's good to go talk to a professional. Uh, I did, and that person helped us craft and develop peace of mind, understanding what can happen down the road, and modeling for us through Monte Monte Carlo scenarios the the likelihood that we'll meet our financial goals over time. But one of the things they can talk about is your withdrawal strategy. And so one of the most popular withdrawal strategies is the 4% strategy. And so what they'll say, and again, I'm not giving advice. I don't want this to constitute advice. I'm just letting you know what I've heard and what people have testified to in other conversations is that if you take your portfolio and you break it into 60% equities or 60% stocks, and 40% bonds, and if you take, based on historical market performance, if you take 4% out every year, then over time you'll never run out of money because you'll always be staying below your average rate of return. I don't know that that's necessarily the approach that we've taken. Um, I, I think we do manage our expenses and our expenses are low, and I would almost suggest that our expenses might be lower than 4% of our total portfolio. But it seems to be something that has a lot of legs to it, has a lot of steam to it. So I think, again, when you go to your financial advisor, you have something to talk about and to say, with my portfolio, the way that it's constructed, do I have 
the ability to retire. And if I do retire in the next two, three, four years, what does that look like? And what are the things that I can do? Because I always think it's better to plan for the worst and experience the best as opposed to the other way around. Because I, I, I think we're all institutionalized to think we have to work forever. And unfortunately, a lot of us create situations through lifestyle creep and through our own spending and our own expense patterns where we do end up having to work until we're 70. And I, I think there's a, there's a different way. And, and because I was able to figure out the way to do it, I, I want to share that with you. So, you know, have that conversation with your, with your financial advisor. So, so I'm going to wrap it all up by, by saying, and, and I wrote this out, so I want to make sure I, I give it to you, is that, you know, although reaching a million dollars may seem tough, Focusing on maximizing your contributions, cutting your costs, and making smart investment decisions may help you achieve a more comfortable retirement. And so it may help you get to where it is that you need to be when you look at your expenses and your and your costs. So on that note, I think I'm gonna I'm gonna cut it off. But as I, I always like to recommend that if you liked or think anything on this channel was helpful, uh, feel free to to leave a like. I always look for. Um, not the likes, but I look for the uh, I look for the comments. I, I respond to every comment because I think if if a person takes their time to comment on something, and that means they're thinking about it. And at the end of the day, I don't claim to have all the answers, but I do uh, I do want us to start thinking about it because I think once we start thinking about things, then it become the seed gets planted for that to become a part of our reality. And once it becomes part of our reality, there's a higher likelihood that we'll get to where it is that we need to go. Because I, I guarantee that if any of us looked back in our lives, we'd find ourselves surprised at, at where we are based on where we were at some other point in time. But because something was a reality, it started to happen. And so that's why I always think it's important to keep a positive reality and always look for what you want as opposed to focusing on what you don't want. So on that note, uh, if you like any of the comment, you find it helpful, useful in any way, uh, feel free to subscribe to the channel. I put up content a couple times a week, usually uh, long form videos like this. I put up on Wednesdays and uh, Saturdays and uh, on usually during the week, I'll put up shorts that just keep the inspiration going because again, I, I think it's important for us to keep things in our mind because they say what, what gets measured gets managed. And so if we're constantly thinking about where it is that we want to go, then eventually it's going to get there. So, but always know that you have a friend in me and my goal and my expectation isn't that everybody retires early, but it is my expectation that you live your best life. And I think working together as a community, we can get there. So lastly, I just want to again, thank, um, I want to thank G Bernie 4714 for the comment. If you have comments or questions, put those in the comments and I'll come back and research and, and try to answer your question to the best that I can. Again, I'm not a financial advisor, but I do try to research these things and help you learn from my experience. So on that note, have a good rest of your day and I will talk to you soon.